Welcome to Doorstep History, which this week is coming from... The Hall of Memory in Birmingham. As we commemorate Remembrance Week. Birmingham's period of remembrance got underway when the Lord Mayor raised the flag of the Royal British Legion and met members of the armed forces in Victoria Square. This year, in the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, we particularly remember the 12,300 citizens of Birmingham who died in the First World War and 35,000 others who were wounded. And we also remember the over 2,200 Burmese civilians who were killed in the Second World War. As Lord Mayor, I am honoured to be patron of the Birmingham County Royal British Legion and to be here to launch the 2016 Poppy Appeal at the start of Remembrance Fortnight. I wish everyone well in their fundraising efforts. Thank you. At Birmingham's Warstone Lane Cemetery, poems were read and a wreath was laid at the Sword of Sacrifice. We will remember. <laughs> I'm part of the Jewelry Quarter Research Trust and we exist to research the Jewelry Quarter but specifically we're interested in the two cemeteries um, and today we've worked with the Commonwealth War Grave Commission and the Living Memory Project and we've been able to, through their funding, put on a commemorative event with the Sherborne Sea Cadet Band. In the council house, the Lord Mayor was chief judge of a school's competition to design a poppy hat to commemorate Remembrance Day. There were around 800 entries from schools across the city. At the Hall of Memory, preparations are now underway for the main Remembrance Service with the dedication of a traditional garden of remembrance. The Lord Mayor laid the first wreath. Lots of other events will be taking place throughout the week across the West Midlands in the build-up to Remembrance Sunday. Now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission have been encouraging people to look after war graves in their localities. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission is encouraging people to visit their local war graves and discover the stories behind the names of those who gave their lives in the First World War. The aim is to encourage community groups to discover, explore and remember their local war heritage. The BBC presenter Nick Owen is the ambassador for the War Graves Commission's Living Memory Project in the Midlands. So why do you think Nick it's important that people should get involved with uh, war graves in their locality? I think it's really important for people to have a sense of history, to have a sense of what went before them in comparatively recent years you know ancient history is a long time ago but we're talking about something in living memory many of us around today know people or related to people who actually took part in the first and second world wars i am fortunate in that sense that my grandfather was at somme and i, I you know spoke to him my father was in the second world war at dunkirk for instance and i have that sort of wonderful direct link um, ab about events at that uh, tumultuous time in world history and I think it's so important that people 
find out as much as they can, especially locally, to know that people from around here gave their lives. Young people, really young, you know, 17 and 18 years old, went off and died at such a terribly, terribly young age. Uh, and some of that history is in these cemeteries, local cemeteries. Thousands of people every year visit the war graves across the world, and particularly those in France and Belgium on the Western Front. But fewer people realise that there are more than 24,000 war graves and memorials in this country. Many of those buried here succumbed to their wounds when they were repatriated home to war hospitals and convalescent homes across the West Midlands, and many also died in a dreadful flu epidemic in 1919. A startling statistic is that everyone in the UK has at least one war grave within three miles of their own front doors. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission would like people to sign up to the project and take part, and you can find out where your nearest war graves are located via their website. This is Norman Bartlam at Warstone Lane Cemetery in Birmingham for Big News. Now youngsters from TNT News in Ladywood have also been involved in some of the memorial events and a special walk has been devised with the British Legion. has also produced a memorial walk so let's go have a look at it. The guide has lots of maps showing places to visit related to the war. Everybody knows about the Hall of Memory or should do but there's more to Birmingham in wars than this place. that there were 2,436 names on here of people who died. There's a special exhibition in the station about railways in the First World War. This is a memorial for all those who worked on the railway and were killed in the First World War. The Queen unveiled this when she opened the station. Wow, there's a big sculpture thing in the ball ring and it commemorates people in World War II. Let's go and have a look then. Leave the station by the main entrance using the pedestrian crossing crossing to the Southridge side of the road. This is it. This is the memorial for all the people who were killed during World War II. This plaque says, during the Second World War, this city suffered 365 air raid alerts and 77 actual air raids. These raids took place between the 8th of August 1940 and the 23rd of April 1943. There were over 9,000 casualties, of whom 2,241 were killed. And this is the list of all the civilians that were killed in Birmingham. This is a reminder how modern day service people may need help from the Royal British Legion. This is the Legion shop on New Street, so let's pop in for some poppies. So Ian, what is this shop about? Well, this is our pop-in centre, and basically it's a place where anybody from the armed forces community can come and talk to us about their needs, and just ask us questions about what we do here, what services we provide. We provide all kinds of different things like advice and information. We have now finished our journey and are back here at the Royal British Legion Poppy Shop where you can get these. So why don't you go on one of these walks for yourself? Heidi Dawis and Zakai Koryang, TNT News, New Street.
touching doorstep history. Join us after the break for more about Remembrance Weekend and we visit Arnhem in Holland, the scene of the famous film A Bridge Too Far. I'm the, uh, the nephew of a certain Arl Cattell from Wensbury. He fought in the battles during the Second World War and he helped take the bridge that is behind me now. And the newspaper of the day referred to the agony of Arnhem. This was the front cover of the Daily Mail on September the 28th, 1944. So join us in a couple of minutes to find out what happened at the bridge and we visit local museums in the area. In September 1944, what became known as Operation Market Garden in the Dutch town of Arnhem took place. It was an unsuccessful Allied military operation aimed at capturing bridges across the River Rhine, opening up routes into Germany which could have reduced the length of the war. Sadly, German resistance resulted in defeat and heavy loss of life. And the newspaper of the day referred to the agony of Arnhem. On the uh the nephew of a certain Arl Cattell from Wensbury. He fought in the battles during the Second World War and he helped take the bridge that is behind me now. What does it mean to you to be here today then? Very emotional, very, very emotional. My uncle, he, he never came back to Holland. He said, I've seen enough of Arnhem, I don't want to go back. He, he was a big man on the, um, the British Legion in, in Wensbury, uh, but he never came back uh, to Holland. And I've sort of came to see the, my club, play Vitesse on him, and it, if, we thought it'd be a good idea to bring part of him back, which is on his medals, but fantastic tribute to him, I think. He'd have been about 27. Uh, when the battle took place. He, he was in the uh, South Staffs Airborne Division and I was led to believe that he was dropped behind enemy lines in the glider. But there's conflicting reports as I say. Uh, according to it there, there was a put at Oosterbeck and they marched down here, took the bridge, held it for so long until, uh, well, Hopefully the troop or the troops had come, but they never turned up. And to get away from the Germans under every fire, he swam the river that we see here, the Rhine, to get away under every fire. This side of the bridge, he found a, a jeep, and he made it back to Oosterbeck. He was one of the lucky ones, as around 16,000 of the 41,000 airborne troops lost their lives, and many are buried and remembered here at Oosterbrook Cemetery, and immortalised in the film A Bridge Too Far. During the summer, whilst on pre-season tour, players and officials from West Bromwich Albion Football Club paid their respects to British airmen who were killed in the operation, and they laid a wreath at the local cemetery, which contains 1,770 casualties all men killed in action in September 1944. And there are a number of really impressive museums to visit. So this became the headquarters of the British 1st Airborne Division and it's now a museum. The museum is visited by a hundred thousand people every year. So let's go and have a look and see what they come to see. Now this is the spot where the famous picture of General Urquhart was taken in September 1944. Not far from Arnhem, there is a museum called 4045, which has got many original artefacts, many still in the state that they were when they were dug up from the fields around the Arnhem area. 
It's also got a great collection of photographs, many of which are unseen, and some quirky items, such as the settee from one of Hitler's homes. Now, one of the biggest bombing raids to occur in Birmingham during the Second World War occurred in Sparkbrook, and a cinema called the Carlton took a direct hit. In October 1940, during World War II, the Carlton Cinema at Taunton Road in Sparkbrook received a direct hit from a high explosive bomb. 20 people were fatally injured. Local history enthusiast Matt Falcon has worked with the Birmingham Air Raids Remembrance Association to produce a booklet and a memorial which has been located at the site of the cinema. Uh, at 7.52pm the, the air raid warning red was sounded and um, the manager Arthur Stenson Cook who lived locally uh, he went out, he rushed outside because he had uh, somebody told him that the the air, you know, that the planes were overhead, so he rushed outside to see what was going on. Um, he could hear, the, he could plainly hear the plane, you know, the, the planes going over, and uh, he rushed back inside. But as he did that, as as he ran back inside, there was uh, one of the bombs landed just on the corner of uh, Dennis Road and Taunton Road outside, which had knocked them silly um, across the road. The home guard were having a first aid course and they were all knocked off their seats but they wasn't aware that, the, that immediately after that the cinema had been hit. Um, one of the survivors a few minutes later had managed to go across and to alert, to alert them that the, uh, the cinema had been hit and the way they came over, picked their way through the wreckage. Um, they were first on the scene to see what had actually gone on, the carnage and all the death and they started getting the walking wounded out of the building and they took them across the road to the drill hall which was attached to Gordon & Co which is now Abdullah's Carpets and, um, and they treated them there the, the, the more seriously wounded were treated in the foyer and you know in the front of the building um, and then obviously the rescue squads came and uh, they, they treated them as and when but um, obviously there was a lot of damage and a lot of a lot of chaos and death. Now this is a story we've brought you before which has proved very popular and it's certainly relevant at this time of the year. The chances are you may not recognise this man or even his name is Jack Judge but he's famous for writing this tune. Now a plaque has been unveiled by local historians in his hometown of Aldbury. Terry Daniels and other local historians have an impressive website, historyofaldbury.co.uk, which details his history. Jack, he, he meant a lot in the war um, to the soldiers, the song that he'd written, and uh, it's a long way to Tipperary. And, uh, he did a lot to raise the morale during that war and so he's a man who ought to be remembered. He really is a one-hit wonder because that's the only song that, of his that's remembered and it's only remembered because it was picked up by the troops uh, as a marching song. But uh, I think it, it is important to all to, to remember who's lived here, what's happened and just really um, you know, uh, why uh, people uh, achieve fame from Aldbury. All five of Jack's living descendants attended the ceremony and Jack's great-great-granddaughter Julian Nicklin performed the unveiling. Hang on.
been so proud today to unveil this plaque in memory of Jack George, who wrote Tipperary, who was my great granddad, and the memories I've got are brilliant. Oh, my granddad used, it was Jack Judge's. Jack Judge's son in law used to be always whistling and singing his songs and saying he used to sit in the pub while he was writing, writing songs and everything, and he was always, you know, with him. And I'm Conor Nicklin and I'm uh, Jack Judge's great, great, great grandson. Okay, so what does, that, what does it mean for you today to be here? It's just good to see that in the family we've had someone that's done something quite big and raised the, uh, raised the happiness of people who fought for us and kept them running on and carrying on fighting. Excellent. And what, what do you think when you hear the Tipperary song being played anywhere? It's a bit different, but it's uh, quite happy knowing that someone in our family made a song and that it's being still sung today. Two nearby streets are a reminder of where Jack once lived. And the library complex was named in honour of Jack and it was opened by his young descendants. And now the new plaque is another reminder of a man whose music is remembered from a long, long time ago. Well that's it from the Hall of Memory on this week's edition of Doorstep History. And in fact that's the last programme in the present series. We'll be back next year with another series of Doorstep History. If you've got any ideas for the programme, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. But for now, thanks for watching. Goodbye, See thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>